I was talking this week to an elderly couple who grew up in the East End of London, but who moved out to Essex in the 1970s when their street was demolished. We reminisced together about places we had in common, but what struck me was the pain they still felt about moving and the resentment, even anger, they still felt about having had no choice in the matter. Yes, their house had been a slum with an outside toilet in a rat-infested yard, rattly windows and rattly pipes, and no central heating, but it was home. The house they'd moved to was new with a proper bathroom, central heating, and a little garden. But they'd never got used to being on that estate. It never became home. And worse, when they got the train back to visit their old haunts, they found that everything had changed. For the post-war planners who designed Essex's spacious new towns of homes for heroes, away from the grime and squalor of the East End, the grief and resistance of those who were moved out of London might have been disappointing. But of course, the communities they'd lived in had been home, and they were given no choice when the decision was made to demolish them. Change is often difficult. We often put up with the second rate because it's what we know. And if we propose something new, someone will say we've never done that before, or even that we tried it once and it didn't work. Anger is often not far below the surface. During Advent, we're challenged to get ready for change, to make ourselves ready for change. And it's not easy. We light one candle after another, watching and waiting. We sing, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. We look forward to being reminded of the story of a precious baby born to a scared young woman in a cold stable. We acknowledge that that baby Jesus is our saviour, the one who saves us. And yet the change that that should bring in us and in others can be surprisingly hard. It takes time. No wonder our reading from James's epistle is about patience. Be patient. Strengthen your hearts, he says. Don't grumble about each other. In our gospel reading, John has sent word to find out whether Jesus really was the one. What was John expecting? In reply, Jesus alludes to the vision of the prophet Isaiah and tells John's followers to notice the changes happening around them. The blind receiving their sight, the lame walk, the lepers being made clean, the deaf hearing, the dead raised and the poor having good news brought to them. And yet some are grumbling and that grumbling will grow into resentment and resentment into deadly anger. No wonder Jesus says, blessed is anyone who takes no offence at me. As we prepare for the coming of Christ, we are challenged again to be open to change, to turn away from the things that we know to be wrong, to reform our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit, and to be reconciled with one another mm. in that same strength. This last point may be the hardest of oil, all. I'm reminded of the account of a meeting that a Dutch Christian, Corrie ten Boom, had shortly after the Second World War. She'd been imprisoned in Ravensbrück for hiding Jewish people from the Nazis. She wrote this. It was in a church in Munich that I saw him, a balding, heavyset man in a grey overcoat, a brown felt hat clutched between his hands. People were filing out of a basement room where I'd just spoken. It was 1947 and I'd come from Holland to a defeated Germany with the message that God forgives. When we confess our sins, I'd said, God cast them into the deepest ocean, gone forever. One moment I saw the overcoat and the brown hat, the next, the blue uniform and a visored cap with its swastika. It came back with a rush, the huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pile of dresses and shoes in the centre of the floor, the shame of walking past this man naked. The place was Ravensbrook, and the man walking towards me had been a guard, one of the most cruel of them all. Now he was standing in front of me, hands thrust out. You mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk. I was a guard there, but since that time I have become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things that I did there, but will you forgive me? Corrie continues. And I stood there, I whose sins had needed to be forgiven again and again, and could not forgive. It could not have been many seconds that he stood there, 
hand held out, but to me it seemed like hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I'd ever had to do, for I had to do it, I knew that. I had established a home in Holland for victims of Nazi brutality. Those who were able to forgive their former enemies were able to return to the outside world and rebuild their lives, no matter what the physical scars. Those who nursed their bitterness remained invalids. It was as simple and horrible as that. And I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart, but forgiveness is not an emotion, I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Jesus, help me, I prayed. I can lift my hand, I can do that much, just supply the feeling. And so woodenly, mechanically, mechanically I thrust my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as, it, as I did, an incredible thing happened. The current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, and sprang into our joined hands. And then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried with all my heart. For a long minute, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then, but even so, I realised it was not my love. I had tried and did not have the power. It was the power of the Holy Spirit. That's Corrie ten Boom's remarkable account of God changing her. You can read her story in her book, The Hiding Place. Being reconciled with others is not easy. Sometimes it's beyond us. Sometimes we need God's help to forgive others who've hurt us. And yet that is what we are called to do. And sometimes we even need God's help to forgive ourselves and so find the strength to change. Brothers and sisters, in this Advent season, let me encourage you to be open to the change that God can make in you through the power of his love and the work of his Holy Spirit. And as you do so, may you know his peace and joy this Christmas.